Phil Harris and Josh Vegan come together in an incredible fortnightly podcast, Dream Big, Move Fast. A progressive contemporary conversation on what it takes to be a dynamic thinker, leader and role model. Backed with over two decades of friendship, trials and tribulations, they teach from real world experience and what it takes to dream big, move fast. Competing is exciting and winning is exhilarating, but the true prize will always be the self-knowledge and understanding that you have gained along the way. Sebastian Co-Building. Phil, what are your thoughts on this incredible quote, one of the great famous ones from the Nike book? Yeah, Nike book, what a great book that is. I know it's for both you and I, one of our favourite books, Josh. I think I've read it a couple of times now. But um, yeah, I, I think that um, definitely one of the things that we share in common, Josh, would be that continual desire and appetite just to continually get better. And winning is awesome and competing is awesome and I love that. But I think that that's not necessarily long-term sustainable success. And you know, if we relate that back to a, um, a real estate perspective, you and I know of the agents that continue to do well. And we're just talking offline a little bit before about leadership, about some of the other great real estate businesses across the country. And I think one of the common threads that they all have in place is that continual appetite just to actually get better whilst at the same time, yes, love winning and love competing, but there's a desire just to continually get better. And I think there's that conversation too that, you know, uh, it's not about the million dollars. It's, it's about the person that you're going to become to be able to write over a million dollars a year in fees if you're a salesperson. It's not about building out a $50 million organization. It's the type of leader you're going to become to build a $50 million organization. So no matter what path you're on or what trajectory, whether or not you're a business owner or you're a salesperson or you're even a property manager who's, you know, managing, um, you know, three or four or $500,000 worth of revenue inside of that business, the most important conversation is about, you know, what's the type of person you're becoming along the journey? And it doesn't really matter about the arrival points. Um, and in every hero's journey, there will be adversity, there will be challenges. And that's actually what makes you the hero. And so from that point of view, you just got to make sure that you're ready for it and settle up. Question for you, Josh. One of my inner struggles, do you sometimes battle with uh, you're not where you want to be? No, not at all. That is, <laughs> of course. Like I mean to say, that, 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 that natural tension is where all greatness comes from. So how do, you, how, do you manage, how do you personally manage that tension between- We'll use it uh, as a fuel source. Yeah, I'm not where I want to be, but at the same time, like how do we have- gratitude and live in the moment but at the same time like my business maybe not quite where I want to be maybe my health is maybe my relationship or you know how do you how do you play that juggle well the thing a little bit like this you know when you see a sunset at night and you might be there and you're standing and you see the sunset and you run 100 meters forward um you're no closer to the sunset are you even if literally you got in a turbo plane or something and you literally went another 100 kilometers you're no closer to the sunset and that's the beautiful thing about the horizon but yet if you stop for just a moment and you look behind you you actually just realize how far you've come and I think that's a natural conversation is, is that that ambition is the thing that ultimately drives you and it's okay to continue to see things on the horizon, but never, you know, uh, be in a position that you don't stop occasionally to look back and just to realize how far you've actually come and the things you've actually done. Yeah, it's great to hear you say that because that's a guy that I do some coaching with has, has worked on me. He said, you know what, always think you might not be, uh, you're not quite where you want to be, but thank God you're not where you were. So yeah, it's I a- <laughs> always like, always keep the focus on, okay, you know where you want to be, but you just actually look back and say how far you've come. And this is also that great conversation about the train where you go, you know, okay, great, you're on a train and you're seeing beautiful conditions and all of a sudden, you know, you fall asleep and then you wake up and all of a sudden there's a, you're at the train stop and you want to get off the train. So you quickly get off because you think it's your stop and the train goes and you look out and then all of a sudden you realize that you've got like, you're in the worst set of conditions ever. How long do you stay on that train track versus how long before you just quickly jump on that train and get the hell out of there? And that really is the whole conversation. If the conditions aren't where you want them to be, then you've got to make the decision, go and chase that and do something really different. Phil, what is important here is to go and have a quick look today about what we've got to call marketing. And, you know, there's a lot of different things about marketing, you know, at a brand level, at an agency level, at an agent level, at a property level. Can you tell me like what actually makes a great brand? Yeah. um, You probably remember this conversation. I I remember um, one of the very, uh, maybe early Eric's that I ever um, attended. And it's hard for me to relate to anything apart from real estate, Josh, but um, I heard John McGrath give a great presentation and, and John spoke heavily about the macro brand and the micro brand. Um, and that was something that really stuck in my mind from about 20 years ago, actually, Josh, and I still talk to my team about it today. And that was getting an understanding that if you're a real estate agent listening, that the macro brand is the organization that you work for. So whether that be, in my case, that'd be the Harris Real Estate example. 
And the reality is, if you're working for an organization, whatever brand that is, if you're an employee of that organization, there's very little you can actually do to have an impact on that that brand being that macro brand. But then the brand that you do have total control over, Josh, is you know what's referred to as being called that micro brand. And that's the brand that, um, that you represent out there in the marketplace that you have 100% total control of. So I think that agents that do really well, um, there's certainly been an emergence from my perspective, Josh, that I think when I maybe or you and I started real estate going back 20 years ago, I think that the company corporate brand played a much larger role in terms of um, an agent's ability to get out there and generate business. But I'd actually go as far as saying now, Josh, I actually think that the roles have actually reversed. It's almost, and not the brand is not important from a company level. It's almost like having a great company brand now, Josh. That's like the minimum entry to get into the game. Does that make sense? Like everybody's got a pretty good solid brand. So I think that roles are reversed now. I actually feel like the agent's actual own personal brand is almost almost superior now to the company brand. And that's what agents do have total control over. So I'm looking forward to that. I think it's going to be a fascinating conversation. So if you look, you look at enduring great brands, for example, like Nike, Mercedes-Benz, Apple, you know, people are now buying empowerment, you know, so they're buying beyond the product or the service, they're buying what it actually does for them. You know, if I buy Nike, I'm hooking on to Michael Jordan aspiration. If I'm buying Mercedes-Benz, I'm buying German engineering and quality. If I'm buying Apple, I'm buying ease of use. I'm buying great product packaging. I'm, I'm buying no viruses. You know, like that's kind of the conversation. So when someone actually makes the decision to do business with you, what are they buying? And are they buying the perception of, you know, significant value or not? And, and where are you actually positioning inside of the marketplace? And if we really think about that, it's like, okay, great. Um, you know, Louis Vuitton obviously charges a lot for a set of shoes. You can go down to Payless or Speed Shoes and you can buy a functional set of shoes for, for probably, you know, one-tenth of the price. What's the difference? Um, well, it comes back down to packaging. It comes back down to how you feel with that experience. It comes back down with what actually happens when you get home and how you unwrap them and, and what, what the unwrapping experience is. is and that ultimately high value, high price point is in a position that it is actually there because it does more jobs for the customer. Whereas low value, low price point, it just gets a job done. And it might be the job, but there's actually no niceties either side of that transaction. So, you know, in Australian residential real estate, we've had some big discounters that have come from overseas and tried to come and tackle the Australian marketplace and had their bags packed for them very quickly and were sent back within two and a half years, not without trepidation. There was definitely some fear with the existing brands in Australia. But what we learned very, very quickly is, is that, you know, you actually have to be good at being able to sell properties. And we were very lucky that a banking Royal Commission actually happened at exactly that point in time. But if that brand that was a flat fee brand all of a sudden had come maybe during the middle of the pandemic when respectfully it was very easy to sell properties when there was, you know, 10,000 buyers turning up to an open for inspection on a Saturday, you, you get the idea they, they might have actually had a significant run at that point. And so this is actually really clear about, you know, you getting into a position that when you start to think about what it is that you do as an agent, you know, what, what actually typifies that brand. And so are you the type of brand that people actually feel that they go, you know what, this is actually, you know, you're jumping in a pool with your suit on. Or, you, or you're not even appearing in, in the videos of that particular property because you're starting to think about really delivering on a level of customer experience and that, that customer experience builds out the brand and, and brand actually therefore equal leads to pricing power. So if you want better fees in the listing lounge room, then I reckon you could get them. So, you know, Phil, we've been experimenting with this in the lounge room right now with for listing presentations. And so I walk in, I say, hey, Phil, I'm lovely to see you and Jen here this evening. And before we begin, I just want to ask you a very simple question. How can I help? And then, you know, you guys tell me you got a job relocation, wherever the story is, and hopefully you really open up. And then my second question is, and Phil, have you already selected your real estate agent? Uh, Phil, well, that happens to be the reason why you're here tonight. And now that you know that they've already chosen you and you're the chosen one, did that listing presentation just change by question two? Completely, yeah. And and that's the whole conversation that each of the consumer's already done the work before that you actually get there. So, you know, when we walk in and, and we go to a great cafe or restaurant, and we've used this analogy quite a bit, but they say, sir, can I please take your jacket for you? And, and madam, thank you. And by the way, would you like some still or some sparkling water? I'd like the sparkling water, thanks. And would you like the Antipodes from New Zealand or the San Pellegrino from Italy? I bet you at that point now, all of a sudden, that's 150 bucks a head. Now, you can also go and get a, a, a great um, you know, roll of, or a great sandwich or something down here in Adelaide at the Michael Market. I think we went down the other day for like 9 or $16, which is you know, pretty phenomenal. And, and yet you can also go and have lunch for $150 a head. And, and literally the, the, the difference actually comes back down into customer experience and thinking about what the customer actually does. So when we have a look at brand marketing and agency marketing and agent marketing and property marketing, they're all very different things. Um, I think that brand marketing has kind of got a little bit lost. If you remember back in the newspaper days, we would actually have some very significant brand marketing prowess around what it is that we did. 
you know, what does that brand actually stand for? Probably one of the most famous brand campaigns in Australia has been the LJ Hooker, um, you know, campaign around, um, you know, nobody does it better. Um, I was actually going to start a rival brand when I, this is me as a little kid at 16 or 17, I was going to start a rival brand called Nobody's because we do do it better, right? But, but the conversation, it, it, that was actually a brand that we connected with. I think right? I remember that. Was the teddy, was there a teddy bear or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, Mr. L, yeah, was, yeah, yeah, there was the LJ Hooker teddy bear. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, and so when you start that, that was a brand campaign, right? What, but then there's agency campaigns. Uh, so, for example, one of the m- most significant um, agency campaigns we're seeing right now is how Presswick Whitney's launch into the lower North Shore of Sydney. Um, and they've got a video of, um, with a whole heap of newspapers and stuff walking around. And it's like, um, you know, they say that we're new. And then they've got a whole conversation of, but we've actually been since, around since 2003 when Finding Nemo was was actually on TV and, and, and the iPod was coming out and all of those things. And so that's a very clear um, agency positioning perspective of what they're actually trying to do. And then you've then got agent marketing, you know, which is about like I'm number one and, and this is the awards that I won last week. And then in addition to that, then we've got property-based marketing. So let's tackle each of those. If you had to say, okay, great, uh, in, in establishing a, a great brand and it is really about positioning. And, and one of the key things I think about is when a lot of people go and start a real estate brand, they, they probably have a look at what franchises are available because all the other brands are taken. And so they just take the one that's, on, that's available off the shelf, not necessarily because it's the best platform or it actually positions them clearly. And, and brand probably comes last because it's often really more tied towards who's available in the marketplace. What, what are your thoughts about that as, an, as, a, as a statement generally about how most people have probably chosen brands when starting a real estate business in Australia? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I, I think that was kind of interesting commentary you said there. It's like they, they take the brand that's available, not necessarily the one that's maybe is, um, is, is most appropriate. But yeah, it, it's interesting, Josh, like my viewpoint on brand, like I, I said it before, I feel like branding's really come a long way in the last 10 years. Like most agents offer a relatively pretty good brand. I'd be interested to get your commentary on it, Josh. Like I, I feel it's getting harder and harder to stand out at an agency level. As I said, my kind of viewpoint is having a strong agent's brand is almost like the, the minimum entry to play. And then after that, it's up to you as an agent to actually get in there and actually point out your personal brand and your personal points of difference. What are your thoughts about that? Well, when I was a little kid and, you know, we were very lucky and, and mum and dad had saved up quite a bit and, and they made the decision they wanted to take us to Disneyland. And, and, you know, that was amazing as a child. Like, wow, like we had made it, man. We were going yeah. to America. And like, you know, that was so phenomenal at the time. And that was, uh, I think that was 98 and in, and in uh, sorry, it was 88. And in 89, I think the, the stock market crashed. <laughs> so like, well, 92 was the big recession. So it was right at the height of that boom. And the interesting conversation is that, you know, mum and dad will always say, hey, look, if ever you need to go to the bathroom, whatever, just let us know and we'll, we'll go to McDonald's. I had to go to the bathroom all the time all of a sudden, you know, and that, that whole idea was that why would you go to Macca's is because they were known for being clean. And, and McDonald's actually had some pillars associated with their brand back then. If you read the behind the golden arches where they say, okay, we want to be clean. We want to have quality. We want to get speed of service, right? And we, and we want to make sure there's a great experience for the customer. So that, that was literally how the whole brand was built on. So I actually think that brands are incredibly important because they are the safety that people can lean on. So I might not have Phil Harris, but I'm going to have someone else inside of the Harris brand. But I know that literally what, what Phil Harris, and you've personified your brand, but that literally that Harris real estate is a flight to quality, it is a conversation around a minimum standard around what it is that you'll do. Um, we're, we're not going down for any non-compliance issues or not turning up to an open home or not doing an auction, like all of that sort of stuff. That's the safety that is provided in sitting inside of that brand. The secondary conversation is then getting really clear about agency branding. So are you playing the game of David or are you playing the game of Goliath? So there are brands that are very clearly challenger brands. So if you have a quick look at it, um, I happen to have a look at health insurance. I use AHM. It's a challenger brand. Um, they don't believe in doing what the big you know, health insurance companies actually do. Their, their advertising is a bit you know, you know, quirky. They're in a position that they're a little bit funny. You know, they're, they're in a position that they, they're very, very clear about how they go to stand out as a brand. Um, the most recent brand launch that just happened is um, another one called Milk Run, uh, which is obviously yeah. going head to head with, with yeah. Woolworths. Yeah. And Woolworths then bought them. And, and interesting enough, Woolworths, rather than having Woolworths home delivery, they're actually doing Milk Run because it's a it's a cheekier brand. It's it's definitely aimed at a demographic between 30 and 45. It's aimed at upwardly mobile, fast-moving consumers who just want items delivered at home, who are not going to be checking the coupons to see, you know, what's cheaper this week if I go in store. And and naturally, they're, they're naturally selling convenience. Now, interesting enough, Coles has recently done a partnership with Uber and I, I know both of those brands. I, I see Coles as a quality brand. I see Uber as a quality brand. But yet I'm massively attracted to using Milk Run 
And, and do, it, do you think a good example of that, uh, Josh, is what Marty Fox has done in Melbourne? I don't know Marty very well, but he competes with like oh, the, the, Mar- the, Marshall White and Jealous Craig, and he seems to have like, you know, he's a great funky alternative in in that marketplace, right? He's very disruptive in that and that branding. I think he's a great example so, of somebody who's done that really well. You David know? and Goliath, yeah. And I think that like, clearly, I think that you know, Brescia Whitney have done that yeah. very clearly in Sydney. Is that they've made the decision to say. They will be David, and the rest of industry is Goliath, and and a, and a great example of that is the Saturday email that they might send of around auction results. We collect all the results, not just ours, but also others. You know, so they're making the decision that they're different, and and we do that because we're very clear about that. And they've made a decision to become a very intelligent brand. So what's what what I mean by intelligence is that if you want to find out the latest of what's happening in your market, they will absolutely know it every week. So on a Friday, for example, I receive an email about everything that's been listed and sold in Balmain by every agency in the area. And on Saturday afternoon at around 5 p.m., I'm going to receive an email with all of the auction results that have happened in my local area, regardless of whether it was their auction or someone else with the number of bidders and all the above. That's about intelligence. So would you say, yeah, so, so their brand represents intelligence, n- no nonsense, high quality, like we know our stuff, we're experts. Yeah, absolutely. Now, having said that, there will be other brands that will be known to do phenomenal video. So if you have a look at a Sam Rogopoulos, for example, inside of Jealous Craig, he's made a very clear decision to do incredible property video. Um, you know, he spends, I think, upwards of two and a half to three thousand dollars per property for it, for just its video content, let alone anything else. And you know, when you listen to the videos, when you watch the videos, he has incredible sound effects. So you will see the kitchen and the toast will be popping and the sound of the kids running yeah, right. through. When you're outside, you'll hear the birds tweeting. When you're in a position, you hear the pool. You'll hear the the splash of someone jumping in or you know Phil Harris doing a dive bomb on his kids. But like, like you, no, that's not on brand for me, mate. <laughs> but, but but you actually you'll hear that sound, but you won't actually yeah. see that visual. And so, like, literally, so that he's all about experiential sound effects sitting inside of those videos, though, so they're beautifully cut to really sell lifestyle and, and to sell escapism. And, and it, it's interesting as well, though, Josh, like, you, you, you need to find your own brand for your own personality type to suit your own marketplace very clearly. As I see, you gave that example of saying, you know, what Marty Fox has done in his, Marty, in his marketplace. I see a lot of people probably trying to be Marty Fox. And it doesn't work for them in their marketplace, just the same as Gab Rubenstein, right? So, Gab's mm-hmm. got, you know, he's got his phenomenal brand in his market but there are certain sectors of society in Australia where if you try and do Gav Rubenstein or Marty Fox marketing that's not going to work for you in your market and, and, you know? so, and there's room for all yeah. I, think, I think the conversation is about like you know who do you intend to become and what do you actually naturally want to do um, we're very clear as a brand I, I don't have any of my personal life sitting inside of what I do on my socials or the video content there are clearly people that do and I've chosen not to do that because I live a very big public life and I'd like a very private private life and, you know, those things are a really important mechanism to me. But but the thing about it is, is that when you're thinking about what you're doing at an agent marketing level, it's really critical because, you know, there can only be so many number one real estate agents in an area. And I think that like, you know, Phil, you'd probably see that like um, there are different times of the year where different awards come out on, on, on websites and on social media. And like, I'm so humbled to have received this award to be the number one agent in Never, this Everyone's area. humbled and everyone's number one, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and we're probably guilty of doing, doing it as well. But, but, I, but, I can't, I but, can't but, but the interesting conversation is, is that like, is that actually for the consumer or is that for you? And so, so what I'm saying is that, okay, great. Um, I actually want someone who's going to be seriously good at what I do. Now, if you have a look at it in terms of process, you know, great property marketing comes back down to a couple of really basic things. Photography has to be phenomenal. Is your photography slightly blurred? Does it have animals in it? Does it have people in it? Does it not? Does it look lived in or does it look pristine? Yeah, stunning photography is the bare minimum, right? Secondary conversation, you need to have video. So, Phil, on average, you'll spend six to eight hours a day on a mobile phone what are you watching? You're watching video. So if you don't have video, you simply just do not have a digital or social strategy. You've got quick hacks on video there, like in terms of duration. Obviously, it's social media based now. Sure. What, what, most so, of your top agents, what's the what's the duration of best so, practice videos now? So what they're doing now is that uh, one property will have three videos produced for it. Yeah. It'll have a reel, which is portrait in nature, uh, yeah. less than 30 seconds preview. It's like really punchy. It's quite edgy. There's a bit of momentum around it. So and, 30 seconds. I've yeah, had some people saying 20. No, yeah. no, so it's fine. And then in addition to that, then there's a one and a half minute like the full feature length film which is the thing that makes it onto your major real estate portals portals. yeah it will also make it onto your socials but it will set as the landscape format and then we then have a 30 second um sales video so when the property is sold which is effectively the preview video layered with all of the key campaign stats that actually happened during the course of that campaign inquiries inspections second appointments contracts offers the amount of i think that's a great takeaway for people that's i've been having those conversations lately but yeah 20 basically 20 second reel 60 to 90 second portal video and then a then a sold story right And, and the benefit about that is if you think about that if you're doing five campaigns a month 
you've now got 15 different video uh, assets in terms of your stream. And then it's about making sure about your stylization. So is it black and white for the first eight seconds of the film? Is it like full colorization? Um, does it have an age in it? Does it not? What sort of sound effects do you put in it? Does it not? And if you start to think about the momentum of what it is that you're building, you absolutely need to make sure. I, I can't be in a video anymore if I'm going to go and do properties and I'm going to go and pace at 200 transactions a year. If I'm doing 25 transactions a year, I can definitely Do you think that's dead? That's important that. takeaway as well? Do you think, hi, I'm Phil Harris and I'm, proud, yeah. I, I'm privileged to present number 22 at High Street here. Again, it's, it's, it's a decision on your brand, but you can't yeah. do it at 200 transactions a year. Yeah. You can't go to 200 film shoots because at that level, like, and so this is like at, at different business models, different things are going to break. Now, if you have a quick look at Ryan Seahunt, for example, he's got a conversation and there's a couple of agents in Brisbane who follow this methodology where they do the camera and the walkthrough of the house rather than the property video. And then they then go back and then they do the voiceover over the top. So it's more like lifestyle. Okay, great. And here's a beautiful three bedroom home. And, you know, and they're doing all of that sort of stuff. And it's just a different stylization. So what I do know though, is that get very clear about what your minimum brand assets are. And this is like, you know, when people walk in and go, I find it really hard to sell vendor paid marketing. Well, I don't because I just say, hey, Phil, quick question for you. Have you ever been online going and try and buy something and it just follows you everywhere you go? So you go online, you try and buy a black t-shirt and then all of a sudden that black t-shirt follows you all over the internet. Well, guess what? We've got exactly the same t-shirt technology. And what that is, what I mean by that is that they go and have a look at your property. We're going to be across all the social streams. So that's now how I'm selling the digital extension products into the social that the various portals will have you buy or off the back of that, you might already have your own in-house right, team right. That, that, yep. that allows you to go to do. But the, but the secret is that without a doubt, I'm not there talking about the Google display ad network and the Facebook pixels and the conversation around geo-targeting and retargeting where I might've been doing that three or four years ago. Now I've learned through the book called Stick by Dan Chip that I'm actually going to tell powerful stories. So I just say, hey, quick question. You're on your mobile six or eight hours a day. What are you watching? Video. So if you don't have video, don't have a digital You're or a social strategy. Yep. Secondary conversation. You know, we've got t-shirt tech, literally. People are going to have a look at your house. It goes across all the socials. So now I've got it into probably less than 38 seconds and go for it. Oh, That's I was, a good little conversation. You know, we call it t-shirt tech. You know, yeah. Have you had that experience where you looked at a black t-shirt then it follows you everywhere? That's yeah, what yeah. we're going to do for your property. And right, so, keep it really simple. So I was, like, to understand. I was yeah. doing some listing presentation assessments the other day and the, the guy said to me, he goes, oh, what are you thinking about marking? I said, I'd really love a video of my property. And, and true, the agent then replied back. He goes, oh, no, nah, no, nah, I wouldn't do it on a property like yours. And, I, and, and at the end of the listing preso assessment, he said, how'd I go? I said, oh, mate, did you ask me what I did? And he goes, no. Well, what do you do for work? I said, well, in the assessment, I was actually the guy who was the head of videography for Rode Microphones. That's why I wanted a video on my property, man. So do, don't argue with the customer if they want to spend more money on marketing. So you've got to get rid of your uh, inhibitions about how products are marketed and actually know what your standards are around how you're going to go and do it. And I just think that like, you know, that um, great floor plans, absolutely critical in terms of the process. And then, you know, body copy that really sells and tells a story. And I think that this is interesting that, you know, we're now in a position that we've got a brand in Melbourne that's currently building out their website so that literally um, they're going to have a different area where investors will land to see properties that are already rented out. And that on those properties that are already rented that are currently available for sale, it's actually going to have a, a box that will appear that goes, you know, a, a, effectively right at the top of that, which goes to show you um, what's the length of the lease, uh, what's the tenant, how long they've been there for, what's the actual percentage return they're getting on the property, where's the upside in the property on some things that you could do, you know, what are some things in terms of depreciation that's available on the property, and then making that available. And they're actually going to have like a, a landlord or an investor's portal where they can actually see property specific content around things that investors or landlords would want to know. Now, this is interesting too, because then I've got other brands that are currently developing out their weekly email and, uh, and, and they're going to wrap some language here because I was talking to my dad the other day and dad said, you know, I'm a baby boomer. He goes, I, um, I could be referred to as a downsizer. I could be referred to as an over 55er. I could also be re referred to as someone who's actually retired. He goes, over 55, I find ages retired. It makes me feel like I've died. And actually a downsizer kind of makes me feel like I've given up on life. So, you know what I'm going to do? He goes, I'd just like to buy a single level home without stairs for your mother and I. So now what we're actually doing is we're looking at that weekly email is actually going to be, okay, very clearly single level homes for families, single level homes for couples and individuals, uh, then uh, lock and leave, which is naturally for people who want to drive their caravan around Australia, um, architecturally significant property. You know, so we're thinking about different lenses of how these consumers are coming in. And then we're going to have a landlord's or investor's email that actually sends it, that when you click find out more about this property, it actually goes to a different link that actually applies a, a layer over the top that actually has investor specific details that they would want to know, length of lease term or the above or upside and any of the above. Because what's happening at the moment is that we're selling all these properties as though it's going to be an owner occupier. 
you know, socialises Wonderland and you're selling that one bedroom apartment when in fact, you know what, it's already leased for six months and somewhere buried in the copies that it's leased, which is kind of like an inconvenient truth for a first home buyer. So, so your job is to start to really think about that, that marketing is about understanding how is the customer going to access this information and how they're going to be in a position that they really get clear about, okay, you, you've connected with my hopes, my dreams and my aspirations. You've actually made it easy for me. And I just find it bizarre that I'd go respectfully to the Harris Real Estate website right now and I go, I'm an investor, I want to buy an investment property and I don't know how to do that. Because if I go find properties currently leased, I can't do that. If I'm my dad, at, uh, at, you know, who's over 55 or in the retiree set or like what he likes to call baby boomers, closer to the sunset than the sunrise, a lot of money, not much time. How come he can't come and find single level properties at Harris? Now, it might just be a filter, but is this, a, is this different for you, Phil, when you're starting to hear this thinking because like no one's really got it nailed. I think that what's actually happening is that the industry is probably a bit tired, a bit same, same, uh, a bit like cookie cutter. We've just been pushing it out for so long. Yeah, no, you're right. And um, I think there's, yeah, I think there's issues that have led towards that as well, Josh. I think that's great innovation. I think largely the industry is obviously being driven by more smaller office environment, which maybe has lacked the innovation and the corporate capital to get behind and make some of these innovative change. It certainly hasn't kept up with other industries like, you know, banking and invest, investor um, sectors and things like that. So I think it's um, it's really, uh, you know, good feedback. In terms of agent marketing, I just kind of switch it around a little bit. Quick kind of takeout for the guys, like Great what, photo. What, what, what are the errors that you see? Like what's a, what's a personal brand audit for agents? Okay, number one thing straight away, um, type your name into Google in incognito mode, see what comes up. You absolutely have to have a business uh, profile page on Google. That just allows people to press a button and call you straight away. It also allows you to bring in all of your different locations where the majority of your uh, reviews would be. And in addition to that, it can also have some of your social streams. So it's actually looking like you're alive. Uh, the next key thing is someone's going to probably land on your LinkedIn profile. Please make sure it's up to date. Um, I had a look at mine the other day. I was like, oh, oh my goodness, I was still talking about what I was doing in 2020 for events, you know, and how everything was going to be hybrid. <laughs> yeah, things have would, changed. You actually, would you say if you're not up to date, just take it down and don't, you're better off not having it there? Uh, I think LinkedIn is a really easy one to get up to date in a couple of seconds. And the other key thing is like someone like Alexander Phillips will add every buyer and every seller to LinkedIn. And then when he sees that they've got a job change, calls them. It's another great conversation of, of talking points. The strategy. And, yeah. and the other conversation and is- And his market, that's- Oh, well, I think it's for everyone's market yeah. now. And, and also too, I think it's it's great because you're building out your database and, and, and also relationships. And someone says, hey, you know, Phil, and hey, Jen, you feel a good guy or not? And she says, yes. And so that's why I make the decision to use him as my agent. The other conversation then when you go and have a quick look at it, your bio on Instagram, what does your Instagram look like? I, I, frankly, I don't need to see you raving in Ibiza in 2017. I get that it was a great Euro summer, but like now is that actually going to help me to make the decision to use you as a one, two or a $3 million real estate agent? Yeah, you, know, um, you know, to sell my house. And then the next conversation after that is then say, okay, great. Do you have a great photo? Um, like, you know, um, we kind of photos where you've still got hair in my situation. Like, you know, it's got to actually look like you. You got to look approachable and accessible and, and you got to be in a position that is, that's beautiful setting and scene. And you got to really think about how you want to be positioned as a, as a product. Um, you yeah, know, and then, then beyond that, then you say, okay, cool. Um, my bio copy has actually got to be the same or it's got to be updated. So on the major real estate websites, on your website, on all of your socials, have you actually got the same buyer copy or not? And, you know, when I go and I do this normally for the change agents when they win every year, the absolute difference between all of those things is absolutely phenomenal because like literally they've just allowed certain of those things just to die. And, and I would say to my dad, hey, you know, don't do Instagram, don't do Facebook. You can do LinkedIn, mate, and that's it. Like, and that's, that's for his generation, that's where he should sit in position because that's where his customers are hanging out. And that's ultimately, if he's not going to be phenomenal in the digital space, leave it to someone else. Very granular question for you. What do you think best practice is for agent profile videos? So video, personal video on your website, major portals, like what do you look for in, a, in, three, a, in three, an agent profile? Three essential questions, who you are, what you do, how you help. Yeah. And, and, and it should be 100%. I don't need a flag rolling out. I certainly don't need a BMW rolling out and I don't need shiny shoes in the in the footage, right? It but, sounds like the absolute normal real estate video. What, what I do need though is I need, I need to know, are you approachable? Like, how do you want me to feel once I've watched it? Like, I think that's a better quality question. How do you want me to feel? So I don't know who you are. I press play. How do you want me to feel post? And that's an interesting conversation. So, yeah, there's lots of things that we can do, but I think that, you know, from an agent brand and marketing perspective, I think it is a good time to go and get really clear if you showed someone who doesn't know you, how accessible do you become to them all of a sudden by watching what you do? What are your brand standards around how you take a property to market? What the minimum standards and requirements are? You know, I've got a client, for example, in Carlton in, in Melbourne. You know, he likes big signboards. 
you know, as, as, as wide as the frontage of the house. If it's a five-meter-wide terrace, he'll Can't get see the house. He'll, he'd, he'd love to get a four-meter-wide sign. Yeah, and, that, and in other council areas, that's not available because of council restrictions. But, you know, get really clear about what that looks like. And, and also, too, they understand that what you're doing allows you to have recruitment power. It allows you to have incredible customer power. And it actually allows you to acquire and to retain more customers so that people can actually go to connect with you over a period of time. And here is one of the other key things I'm going to say, and it's a nice way to finish this one today. There was a, a massage gun that came out, like Theragun at the time. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, great. I might get that because I run a beard and it'd be good to kind of ease up the quads and whatever. I was like, okay, great. So I started following it on Instagram. And then naturally after 60 days of watching that, I went and bought one. And then one day I kind of caught myself. I'm like, why am I watching people massaging themselves with this massage gun when I already own one? So I unfollowed the account. So sometimes people are going to follow your account whilst they're in the mood. And when they're no longer in the mood, they're going to opt out. And that's actually a really important thing to actually start to understand around what it is that you do. Phil, our final one here in terms of principles, separate to differentiate. If they can't see the difference, they won't pay the difference. What are your thoughts on that as a principle? I think that is the code that we all need to crack. And I was, you and I were talking before I spoke at a conference um, earlier this week and in an industry that seems so overcrowded, Josh, it looks like we all do the same thing. At the end of the day, every single real estate business, we're here to sell residential property and manage residential property. So how do you find your own personal differentiation inside your organization to stand out from the competition? That was basically exactly what I spoke about. So I think it's a really good quote. And the things that I focus on is that um, really, yes, you're going to have a great brand. It's hard to differentiate, but there's some things you can do. Um, I think it's a lot easier, Josh, to differentiate inside a real estate business on the actual inside, what you do for your staff and how you operate. Mm. That's where I think you can be dramatically different to your competition. And if you play the long game, then yeah, you can have some real um, upside compared to your competition. I would leave you on this. Don't hope the customer's going to figure it out. So my dad would always say to me, tell them and tell them and tell them again. And the person who's going to tell you the reason why they're using you is going to be the person who signed the agency agreement within 36 hours of signing that authority because they're going to tell you what they think they've bought. I don't want the feedback at the end of the sales process because that is whether or not the auctioneer was good. Right? What I want to know is that what do they think that they've bought directly after the listing preso? And naturally, if you say, oh, you know, accessibility to buyers, I thought Phil was really genuine. I thought X, Y, Z, that might actually be the thing. So when we do this as a training company, I go and ask people that question. They say, there's usually three specific most common answers that I'll get. Number one, Josh, we really love your energy. Number two, we, we fundamentally love the way that you think. And number three, you're the systems guy. Tick this box, get that outcome. So I always think about it like, like every single time I leave people, how am I making sure that I've got great energy? What am I doing to make sure that I'm thinking in a new and unique way that gets them you know, some significant value? And how do I actually make sure that I put it into a system? And I want people to leave feeling more motivated and more confident after they've had an interaction with me. Feeling good and ready for more? Thanks for joining us on Dream Big, Move Fast. Move Fast.